Greetings everyone, my name is Stephen Cook and welcome to my channel Thinking on Scripture. Today we are picking up in our continued study on knowing and doing the will of God. Now we've covered a variety of uh, topics up to this point or subjects. Uh, we talked about the revealed will of God is over against the secret will uh, and how the revealed will of God has been set forth in propositional terms and have been written down for us such that we can go to the Bible and we can read it for ourselves and know what it says. And we can understand those portions of Scripture that speak to us directly as believers who are part of the body of Christ. And we can know what God's will is for us, how He directs us. Now, for the unbeliever, the will of God is that he or she trust in Christ as Savior, that they come to believe in Christ, uh, believing that he died for their sins, was buried and raised again on the third day as a historical fact, and that what Christ accomplished on the cross uh, was that he bore all of their sins, all of my sins, all of your sins. And when he died upon the cross, he forever satisfied every righteous demand that the Father has uh, for our sins, past, present, and future, because all sins were future uh, from the time of the death of Christ. Our sins were all future. And so when one comes with the empty hands of faith and simply trusts in Christ as Savior, uh, one makes the most important decision uh, that one can make in one's life, and that is to turn to Christ as Savior, and again, to believe in Him. We don't trust in ourselves. We don't trust in any system of works. We certainly don't uh, believe that salvation comes by joining a church, raising your hand, walking an aisle, being water baptized, or any of those things. Not that those things are wrong. They may be good in themselves. They may be fine, uh, but they're not salvific. Uh, to be saved means that one turns to Christ and Christ alone, and, and, and a person needs only Christ to be saved. So concerning the will of God, the gospel is the issue for the unbeliever. Now, once the unbeliever turns to faith in Christ and, and believes in him and casting himself completely upon Christ and what he did for him at the cross, uh, then many wonderful things happen. As I've mentioned in other lessons, uh, that we are forgiven all of our sins, uh, that we are given eternal life, that we are given the gift of righteousness, that we are transferred from Satan's domain of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved Son. We are called children of God, brothers and sisters to the King of kings and Lord of lords. We enter into the royal family of God. Uh, we are given a citizenship that is in heaven. We are given a spiritual gift. Uh, we are given a portfolio of spiritual assets. Ephesians 1.3 makes that clear. And uh, we are called to be ambassadors. We are called to be the king's representatives in a fallen world. We are to be lights in a dark world. And so God has blessed us, and he calls us to a wonderful life. And when we as Christians come to understand that and what it means to be in Christ, in Christo, Paul, Paul uses the prepositional phrase, when we come to understand that, then it opens up for us a wonderful, wonderful understanding of how good our God is and what he has done for us and just how he has blessed us in this life and how we can serve him and we have a personal sense of destiny that develops over time that is absolutely wonderful. And we know that God works all things together for the good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 makes that very clear. And listen, God has a purpose for us. The scripture is absolutely clear on that. And not only does he have a purpose for us, but he has placed us at this time in, in history, uh, on the planet, uh, that there are no accidental people in this world. And there are no little people. And there are no little places of service. We are all part of his, of his plan and his program. And we all have a life of significance uh, because we are children of the king of God himself. And so we can have a place in this world and we can understand that God is controlling the events of history in such a way that we know Christ is coming back. We know what our future is. We have a bright future. We have a hope. And the unbeliever doesn't have this. And so we, we appeal to people. Uh, we appeal to them that they will turn to faith in Christ, that they will come to be part of the family of God and to understand just how wonderful it is to be a child of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we're free from problems. Jesus said, you will have trouble in this world. He said, look, the world hated me. It's going to hate you. 
but God has also given us the ability to, to, to deal with those troubles. He says, look, I've not left you as orphans. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, our parakletos, uh, the Greek word is used there, our comforter, our counselor, to guide and to strengthen and to encourage us. Now, sometimes he does that directly. Sometimes he does that through other people. Uh, through circumstances, God can encourage us in a number of ways. But God is faithful. Uh, he is always faithful. And, uh, and so as his people, we know that there will be trials in this world. And we're fine with that. In fact, the trials, James 1, 2 through 4, James says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing knowing that it produces in you patience and patience endurance and endurance proven character, that you may become complete, that you may become mature, as it were, uh, equipped to serve God, to walk with him. And so even when trials come in, in our life, we can, we can view them as part of God's plan to help develop us, to refine us, to burn away the dross of, of weak character and to develop again those golden qualities that he wants to see in us. And, um, and so we can understand that God is in control and we can have absolute confidence and we can trust in him. And, uh, and this becomes quite a powerful thing to understand uh, as we begin to advance in our walk with the Lord. In fact, David understood this, uh, that we are all significant, uh, that God has a place for us, that he is aware. You see, God is omniscient. He knows all things. And God is omnipresent. He is equally and fully everywhere all the time. And God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is able to accomplish all that he desires. Uh, I love where David said, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. I'm here, I'm in Psalm 139. He said, You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down, and you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. And even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful uh, for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. And then he says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Uh, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in, in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. And if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will become night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. David was overwhelmed by this, and it overwhelms me to think that, that God is intimately acquainted with me. He knows the hairs on my head. He knows my thoughts, my words. He knows my failings. And he loves me anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So when I think about how good God is, when I think about how wonderful my Lord is, when I think about how he has a plan for my life, this is so profound and so overwhelming at times to think about his goodness. But one of the things that gives me confidence in this life, and I do struggle, I struggle with the pressures of life. We all do. I can have down days. I can have days where, where I'm uh, concerned about what may be going on uh, with issues at work or society. I mean, none of us are impervious to these pressures. But I try very much to stay in the Word in such a way that the Word of God becomes so saturated in my thinking and it flows so much in the stream of my consciousness that, that I am reminded that God is in absolute sovereign control. And I am confident about these things. And even though life may be seen to be a wreck at times, I can still know that He is sovereign in control. And that will be this final lesson here on God's providential will. So follow with me. God's providential will refers to the outworking of his sovereign will in such a way that he creates circumstances that direct our lives and destiny. And believers who understand this will make their human plans contingent upon God's sovereign plans. And look, I make plans. I make plans. I made plans 
years ago, I made plans to be a truck driver. Can you believe that? I actually drove a truck for three years. I had a class A CDL. I used to work on 18 wheelers. I used to do welding and electrical work and it was fun. I enjoyed the labor. Uh, but there was a time where I thought about being a truck driver. And this was back in, uh, in, in the early nineties, 91, 92. And I had applied for a truck driving school. I was living in Lubbock and had applied for a truck driving school in Amarillo. And uh, I had been accepted and it was a six month program. And I was going to go up there and, and live for six months, uh, while my wife stayed in Lubbock and continued to work. And we had just enough money in the bank that we had figured it out that I could go up there, I could work, I could go to school, finish it, and then, you know, have this life planned as a truck driver. And, uh, and, uh, a few months before, uh, my going up there, uh, I was involved in a wreck. It wasn't my fault. A guy on the freeway had cut off several cars and we all slammed on our brakes and smashed into each other. And the turkey that caused the accident drove off and, Anyway, we all filed our insurance and, you know, since the guy who caused the accident got away, we were all stuck with our own insurance. And anyway, our car got paid off, but we had just enough money to, to buy another car, which we bought for about $1,200. And so we bought it, we were done. And, uh, and one week to the day, uh, having our new car, I uh, was going through a light, a green light, and a guy in a truck thought he could beat me. And, uh, and so we plowed into him doing about 45 miles an hour and it totaled our car and totaled his truck and we spun around and the tire in the back of his truck rolled across the freeway and anyway, and, uh, the guy gets out of his truck and the first thing he says is, oh, I knew I should have waited, you know, we had a green light, I thought I could make it and I think, okay, well, you know, nobody's injured so we're all right. Five minutes later, a police officer shows up. And this guy changes his story. He says, no, officer, I had a green arrow. He ran a red light. I'll tell you what, my blood pressure shot through the roof. I was, I was pretty hot. But the police officer did the best he could. But at the end of the day, it was my word against this guy's word. My wife was in the car with me, but still it was our word against his. And we couldn't prove anything. So again, you know, it canceled each other's insurance out. So we had a whopping $500 left in the bank. And we wound up buying a car for $450. It was a 1974 Plymouth Satellite. I think it had a 308 motor in it. It was an old cop car. Anyway, it was, a, it was a, I mean, this car barely ran, but it ran. But my point is, is that I had all these plans. I was going to go to truck driving school. I was going to, you know, that was going to be my career. And in one week, God turned that all around. He used these two accidents to drain our bank account down. And at that point, I couldn't go. We didn't have the means to go anymore. And so I thought, well, truck driving school's out. I got to stay local. So it was at that time I started thinking about college. And so I wound up jumping into uh, college. I went to a South Plains College and then later on to uh, Wayland Baptist University where I graduated and then went on to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where I finished my Master of Divinity, and then Tyndale Theological Seminary, where I earned a doctorate. Uh, but my point is, is that God made a change in my life. I had plans, and God said no to those plans. He had another plan for me, and that plan was for me to uh, have academic studies. He didn't want me driving a truck on the highways. Again, not that there's wrong, anything wrong with that, but that was not God's plan for me. And he used circumstances in such a way to change the direction of my life. And there are certain passages that reveal this. First Chronicles uh, 13, 2, David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is from the Lord, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in all the land of Israel, and so on. But notice what he says, and if it is from the Lord... Notice Acts 18, 21, and taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set out from Ephesus. So Paul had a plan. He said, I will return to you. That was Paul's plan. But Paul understood that his plan was contingent upon God's plan. And God may have different plans. He certainly had different plans for me. And he may have different plans for you. But how God works in our life is in such a way that he controls the circumstances of our life to direct us to the place that ultimately he wants. James 4.15 again demonstrates the point. Um, now let me back up here. Uh, and he says here, 
Now let me back up. He says, come now, you who say today and tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. You see, these are business people who are planning on on engaging in business activities and anticipating out, you know, at least a year out, some, some long-range planning here. And yet James says, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, see, this is, this is the correct way of doing it. If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. So again, this is a, a healthy way of thinking that we understand that we can make all the plans in the world, but God may, he may overrule those plans. He may have something different for us. And so again, uh, believers who understand this will make their human plans contingent on God's sovereign plans. Now, back in the day when I had my wrecks, and again, neither one were my fault, but God used those circumstances to change the direction of my life. I didn't understand God's sovereignty or providence. I was growing. I was coming to understand it. But later on, I understood it. But just like other times in my life, uh, I trusted the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but I know who you are. And I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know that you're good. And I, you know, think of Romans 8, 28. Again, God works all things together for the good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And this speaks of believers, advancing believers, really. So as God's people, we know that the Lord, we know the Lord and his will for our lives because his written word informs and guides us. We have his directives. The Bible is our pedagogical guide. It instructs us. It informs us. It teaches us. Now, in addition to Scripture, God directs us providentially as He controls the circumstances of our lives to His desired end. However, let me be clear here. Only the believer with a thorough knowledge of God's Word can properly interpret his or her circumstances and know what God is doing. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're ignorant. We're at a loss. We're just without the necessary information. I can look at certain examples in the Scripture, and I can see uh, where God directed the lives of people. I can see where He directed Joseph. I can see where He directed Saul. I can see where He directed David. I can see where He directed Paul. I can see God moving in the lives of people and how He operated and that provides a construct, a grid, that I can put over my life that allows me to interpret what is going on circumstantially. Now, it's never as clear as knowing his word and his directives. Um, but nonetheless, we can understand what God is doing in the world by understanding his providential circumstances. So interpreting circumstances or divine impressions of the heart on the heart is never as clear as knowing God's Word. Uh, I was listening to uh, a lecture series uh, by Dr. Not Dr. Charles Clough, uh, Pastor Charles Clough, uh, who did the Biblical Framework series. I don't think he has a doctorate. I think he just has a, a master's degree um, from Dallas Theological Seminary and then an MS in uh, Meteorology from Texas Tech, I think. But I went through his uh, Biblical Framework series a few years ago, and boy, that was a real eye-opener. If you've never had the chance to go through that series, I think it's 224 lessons. That was a real blessing to me. Uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, I was a chauffeur at the time uh, for a year, and I would drive my clients around, and you go out on the runway, pick them up on their jet, uh, from their jet, load them in the car and take them to some restaurant where they'd sit for three or four hours, and I'd sit out in the parking lot on the clock. But I was in seminary, and so it gave me a time to read through, uh, you know, my theological works. Well, while I'm driving around or sitting in the parking lot, I'm listening to these lessons by, by Clough on the Biblical Framework series, uh, and it was just rocking my worldview, really, really good stuff. But anyway, I was going through a lesson of his recently because he went through the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm following his lecture series there as well. But he makes this comment that caught my attention, and I wrote it down, uh, and it's in the footnote if you want to chase it down in the article. He says, quote, There is a mystical element to Christianity in how the Lord leads you, and he impresses upon you different things. He says, but you can never elevate that mystical part of your Christian life and make it equal to the revelation of Scripture. Because the revelation of Scripture is the measuring stick so that you can tell the difference between Christ in the heart and heartburn. How you do that is whether it fits Scripture. 
end quote. And by the way, that was taken from uh, Lesson 21 uh, on his series on um, on um, uh, through the book of Deuteronomy, in which he's talking about moral relativism. And I think it was roughly about the 17th minute in Lesson 21. If you want to chase that down, it's there for you. But I thought that that was a good quote, and that's why I put it in there. Now, God's providence. What is providence? Provideo. Uh, is the word uh, that we get uh, for providence. And pro means before, and video, video means to see, and it means to see to it beforehand. So God's providence is his continual care over the creation that he brought into existence. You see, God continues to create and to control circumstances in order to direct history according to his predetermined plan, all for his glory and the benefit of his people. And I'll tell you, sometimes when I work on these sentences, I, I rework it and rework it until I get the language tight enough. And even then, I may go back and revise it at some future time, but this is kind of where I was at. That God continues to create and control circumstances. In other words, he meddles in the affairs of mankind. He's involved in our affairs. And he does so in such a way in order to direct history according to his predetermined plan. Because in eternity past, God had a plan. And that plan is set forth, we, we think of it today, if you ever study theology or systematic theology, you're going to deal with the subject of divine decrees uh, and the order of the decrees. And um, anyway, it's, it's good theological training. But God had a plan from eternity past, and that plan involved the current events of time and space and history. And if God had, I think it was uh, Lewis Chafer who said that if God had 10,000 blueprints in front of him, and he could have had an infinite number of blueprints, that the one that he is currently implementing is the best plan that he could implement. And that involves you and it involves me, which means that we have been selected to be part of his plan in history, uh, that we have been elected to purpose. Uh, and, uh, and this is very important to understand. So God continues to create and to control circumstances in order to direct history according to his predetermined plan, all for his glory and the benefit of his people. You see, people live in the flow of history and are moved by the circumstances that God controls. And that's true, isn't it? Now, uh, J.I. Packer um, says here, I'm quoting him, he says, Providence is normally defined in Christian theology as the unceasing activity of the Creator whereby in overflowing bounty and goodwill, he upholds his creatures in ordered existence, guides and governs all events, circumstances, and free acts of angels and men, and directs everything to its appointed goal for his own glory, end quote. And there, he goes on, if you ever get a chance to read his... Uh, his um, well, this is taken from the New Bible Dictionary, but he's he's got some really good theological works, too. I enjoy his writings as well. I don't agree with him on his ecclesiology and eschatology, but he's really, he's really good in, in many other areas. So let's move on here. So God is holy, and he never creates evil. However, he can and does control those who do. Satan and those who follow him are ultimately under uh, God's sovereign control, and even their evil plans and actions are used for his glory and purposes. For example, Joseph was mistreated by his brothers and sold into slavery and taken to Egypt, where he suffered greatly. You can read about that in Genesis 37. Uh, Genesis 38 is an excursive into uh, um, Jacob, but Genesis 37, 39, uh, 40, 41, and following to the end of the book really deals with Joseph in the book of Genesis. But God gives Joseph uh, dreams, and Joseph, being a young man, uh, roughly about 17 years of age, reveals those dreams to his father and mother and his siblings, and they wind up hating him as a result uh, because uh, the sheaves, their sheaves, bowed down to his sheaf, which was them bowing down to him, and they detested that thought. Now, the question that rises in my mind is, did God know that he was going to give Joseph those dreams? Of course he did. He's God. He's omniscient. He knows all things. And he acted in such a way so as to give Joseph those uh, revelatory dreams. Did God know that Joseph was going to reveal those dreams to his brothers? Yes, he did. Did God know that Joseph's brothers were going to hate him and mistreat him and want to kill him, but eventually sell him into slavery down in Egypt? Yes, he did. And God used their evil actions 
to get Joseph down into Egypt uh, to fulfill his word. Because back in Genesis 15, God made a prophecy to Abraham when he ratified the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15. And uh, Abram, Abraham was asleep at the time. And God gave him a dream. And in the dream, uh, he revealed to him that his descendants would be uh, strangers, captives in a foreign land for 400 years. That would be 400 years down in Egypt. Now, this was a prophecy that was given uh, to Abraham. And then Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had his 12 sons of whom Joseph was a part. And so God used the, he created the circumstances that would get Joseph down into Egypt. Then later God would send seven years of, and Joseph winds up at Potiphar's house. You know the story. I'm just sort of capping here, given the high points. He winds up in Potiphar's house, mistreated by Mrs. Potiphar, lied about. Joseph winds up in graduate school uh, for a few years in prison in part of his theological training. And uh, there he learns uh, to wait upon the Lord. And God then sends Pharaoh a dream uh, that had seven fat cows eating seven skinny cows. Uh, interesting dream. But only Joseph could interpret the dream. This gets Joseph out of prison. Pharaoh then elevates Joseph to the right hand, uh, to his right hand, uh, being second in power in Egypt. God then sends seven years of, of, uh, of bounty upon Egypt. He causes the rains to fall and the harvest to produce in abundance. And this would be followed by seven years of uh, famine that God also created and caused to come about. And in the second year of the famine, I think it was second year, uh, Joseph's brothers up in Canaan are feeling hunger pains. And God then uses that to get them to go down to Egypt where they wind up meeting with Joseph. Again, all orchestrated by God. God's controlling the circumstances that are moving the events of people's lives. And Joseph's brothers didn't know what was going on. They didn't think from the divine viewpoint. Joseph did, but his brothers didn't. But nonetheless, they, his brothers sold him and mistreated him, and he was sold into slavery where he suffered greatly. Yet later in his life, Joseph interpreted their behavior from the divine perspective. See, this is where a mature believer can make sense of life and can even treat well those who mistreat them. And from the divine perspective, he told his brothers, he said, Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Notice what he says, for you sent me, for God sent me before you to preserve life. D uh, Joseph here saw the hand of God in the circumstances. He saw his brothers behaving in, a, in an evil way. In fact, he's about to call it what it is. He's about to call it evil. But God supersedes in such a way that he controls those circumstances that gets Joseph down into Egypt. <clears throat> Joseph repeated himself a second time, saying, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Love that. That's divine perspective. Again, he said, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So God moved the circumstances. He created and controlled the circumstances in such a way so as to get Joseph down into Egypt. Later, he told him a third time, as for you, you meant evil against me. See, this, this is the evil of their hearts. And he calls it what it is. And this is, this is my point, that you meant evil against me. And people will behave in an evil way towards God's people. And he says, as for you, you meant evil against me. That was the motive of their heart. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. God used the evil actions of Joseph's brothers to save them at a future time because by their evil action, they don't know it. They're just behaving out of their evil heart, which God is not causing, but he is controlling nonetheless. And he protects Joseph. He, he permits them to mistreat Joseph. See, we see the permissive will of God, but we see the overruling will of God in the sense that God comes in and he directs circumstances to get Joseph down into Egypt. And then at a later time, God then winds up preserving those who meant to harm him. Gotta love that. Gotta love that. That's just, that's mind blowing right there. But do you see how that divine perspective uh, gave Joseph the ability to interpret what was going on? 
and to see the hand of God in his life and even in the action of his brothers. And again, he calls it what it is. He says it's evil. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. What was the end result? In order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. It was God's providence that drove Saul to chase after his father's donkeys and then led the prophet uh, uh, Samuel and and then to be led to the prophet Samuel, an anointed king of Israel. Read 1 Samuel 9 and 10 one time, uh, chapters 9 and 10, and you'll read where uh, Samuel leaves his house and he goes in pursuit of donkeys that escaped from his father's uh, uh, den. And here's Samuel, here's, uh, here's, excuse me, here's Saul. He's out there in the wilderness. He's chasing after these donkeys. He's frustrated. He's wandering around in the wilderness, chasing after these donkeys. He's got a servant with him. God comes to Samuel and he tells Samuel the prophet, he says, look, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to bring you the man that you are to anoint king. Now, Samuel doesn't know who he is. God doesn't reveal it until he, until he's within eyeshot of, of Samuel. And Joseph, excuse me, Saul does not know he's being led by the Lord because God tells Samuel, I'm going to bring him to you. So God is moving the circumstances. Saul's donkeys getting out were not a coincidence. They were part of God's sovereign plan because he knew that Saul would go in pursuit and Saul couldn't find him. And at one point, Saul was ready to throw up his hands and say, okay, I'm done. Let's let's go back. My dad's worried about me, I'm sure. And his servant says, hey, look, I know there's this guy over here, this seer, this prophet, Uh, and he can help us. And Saul says, well, you know, we don't have anything to give to him as as an expression of gratitude, a thankfulness, a a token of our appreciation. And and the servant says, I've got to give for him. It's not a problem. And so they wind up going, and when Saul walks in, uh, the Lord tells Samuel, that's the man. Saul had no idea. He had no idea that God was controlling the circumstances. All Saul knows is he's out chasing donkeys. And God is directing him to Samuel to be anointed the king of Israel. He has no idea. And again, that's the brilliance of it. And I love those kinds of passages. Uh, read 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10. You'll, you'll see the story. It's, it's, it's really quite fascinating. But it's a tremendous display of God's providential control in the sense that he is moving the circumstances and the events of life to get his people to where he wants them to be. It was God's providence that directed Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem so that the baby Jesus could be born at the appointed time and place. Later, Joseph and Mary were compelled to go to Egypt in order to preserve the baby Savior. It was God's providence that forced Aquila and Priscilla out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius' decree only to meet the Apostle Paul in Corinth and join him in Christian ministry. You see, God moves in the lives of his people, and what may be a negative circumstance in one situation moves people geographically to wind up in the presence of somebody else so that they can serve in ministry together. I mean, this is what God's doing. It was God's providence that put the Lord Jesus on the cross to be crucified by the hands of godless men. Peter, charging the Israelites in Jerusalem concerning Jesus' death, said, This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see, in in Acts 2.23, we see the coalescence of divine and human will in such a way that even though these men are evil and attacking uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to put him upon the cross, God is using their actions to accomplish his predetermined plan that Christ go to the cross and die not only for their sins, but my sins and your sins and the sins of everybody. That's mind-blowing. So again, Peter says, This man was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And after being persecuted by the leaders in Jerusalem, Peter and John, along with others, said to God, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Did you catch that? So here we see uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel and they are coming against Jesus, and yet they are doing exactly what God 
uh, what was according to God's purpose, what he had predestined to occur. So in these verses, we see people behaving sinfully, whether Joseph's brothers or human rulers who abuse their power, and yet God used their sinful choices to bring about a greater good. Because God is righteous, all his actions are just. Because he is loving, he directs all things for the benefit of his people. Because he is good, he causes all things to work together for good to those who, uh, to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Love that. Love that. Concerning Christian ministry, God providentially opens and closes doors of service. And we should realize this as ministers. Throughout the New Testament, an open door refers to a divinely orchestrated opportunity for sharing the gospel and engaging in Christian ministry. Uh, here it says when in Acts uh, 14, 25 through 27, it says, when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attila, uh, or, uh, um, um, Atalia. From there, they sailed to Antioch from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them. See God opening doors of ministry and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. On one occasion, the Lord had closed an opportunity for ministry. Uh, in Acts 16, 6, and 7, it says, They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's fascinating. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. See? He did not permit them. So that's God's overruling will. See see how this comes together? See how these work together like strands of a spider web? You pull on one thing and the whole thing begins to move. It's a very complex uh, system of thought, but you can see how it works together in a very integrated way. Uh, but even though he closed a door there, he opened another door. In Acts 16, 9 and 10, it says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to them and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, what? Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see? So there were closed doors of opportunity, open doors of opportunity. And a few more closing points here because we're almost done with our study here. An open door for ministry can have opposition. It can have opposition. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, th uh, 7 through 9, he said, for I do not wish, he says, for I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits. See, and there's that point, if the Lord permits. So he's talking about God's permissive will. See, see how this all comes together? He says, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. Notice what he says here, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Did you catch that? A wide door uh, for effective service has opened to me. And yet having an open door for ministry does not mean that there not, will not be opposition. And this is important to understand. So a wide door for effective service is open to me, and there are many adversaries. Uh, so an open door for ministry can have opposition, and it does not remove everyday circumstances of life. It doesn't, it doesn't remove the everyday circumstance of life. Paul says, now when I came to Trous for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, again, that, that circumstance where God opened uh, an opportunity for ministry, he said, I had no rest in my spirit. Not finding Titus, my brother, but taking my leave, I went on to Macedonia. So Paul, even though he has this open door of a ministry, he still is concerned about his brother Titus. And so those everyday concerns don't go away. And an open door for ministry should be sought with prayer. Colossians 4, 2, and 3. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at that time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. And so again, it should be sought with prayer. And once open, cannot be shut by people. You see, God controls these circumstances, not people. God is directing history, and he's directing the, directing the circumstances of life in such a way so as to move us through history, uh, and this ultimately for his glory and the return of Christ. 
Revelation 3.8 says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. So when God opens the door, he controls it. As God's people, we do not create occasions for Christian ministry. We don't. We don't manufacture it. We simply accept those provided for us by the Lord. Ephesians 2.10 says we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. You see that? I love that. You see? Our life is, is set for us. God has a plan for us. Even my making this lesson today and other lessons, this is something God has permitted for me. It is an open door of ministry for me that God has given. Uh, now, there's been times where I would love to be a pastor in a church somewhere. I have a home Bible study, and I attend church, and I, I do speak at the church on occasion. I do fill in at Tyndale Bible Church and other ministries. There are people sometimes ask me to come speak at their church or at some, at some uh, conference or something, and occasionally I will do that, and God will open that door for me. But, um, but the open door of ministry for me uh, has largely been through writing, uh, through my blog, uh, Thinking on Scripture, through my home Bible study, where I teach expositionally through the Word of God, and I record those, and those get put out on my podcast. And I have I don't have a large following. It's fine. It's whatever the Lord provides. He'll 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 make sure it lands in the right hands. I I'm not worried about that. And uh, and so you know I have people around different states. I, have people even in other countries that will sometimes write to me and say, hey, I listened to your lesson. I think, yeah, great. Uh, but then I also have this, um, this video channel where lessons are put out and people are watching. So, so the Lord has opened this ministry opportunity for me, and I'm very thankful for it. So in summary, concerning this series of lessons uh, we've gone through on knowing and doing the will of God. Knowing and doing God's will is largely a matter of knowing His Word and walking in it. That's, that's the biggest issue. I am a Bible teacher. I always push people to the Word to know it. Those who are positive to God will desire His Word in order to obey it. From Scripture, we know about the Lord Himself, we know His sovereign control over His creation, and what He desires of us. His permission of sin, as well as His directing history providentially to the return and to the reign of Christ. I so look forward to the return of Christ. I do. Especially at His second coming. I mean, as a Christian, I'm waiting for the rapture to occur, and I know that there will be seven years of tribulation. But at the second coming of Christ, he will establish his kingdom upon the earth, and he will rule in righteousness, and that is going to be such a wonderful time. Um, so again, we're looking forward to the return and to the reign of Christ, and where scripture is silent, we may try to ascertain his will through the circumstances of life, but such understanding must always be subordinate to the clear revelation of scripture. So that concludes this series of lessons. I hope that this has been helpful to you. It's always uh, refreshing to me uh, to go through this. I've taught through this before, although I've expanded my notes from previous lessons. Uh, but this has been refreshing to me. I hope it has been refreshing and informative to you. And I do thank you. If you did like today's lesson, be sure to subscribe to my channel if you want to get more videos like this. Uh, but I wish you a blessed day. Thank you.